Chapter Three, Part One of the Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty, Its Cause and Consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Chapter Three, Part One the mutiny that captain bly that is the thing i am in hell i am in hell fletcher christian horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts and from the bottom stir the hell within him for within him hell he brings and round about him nor from hell one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place now conscience wakes despair that slumbered wakes the bitter memory of what he was what is, and what must be worse. Of worse deeds, worse sufferings, must ensue. In the morning of the 28th April, the northwesternmost of the Friendly Islands, called Tafoa, bearing northeast, I was steering to the westward with a ship in most perfect order, all my plants in a most flourishing condition, all my men and officers in good health, and in short everything to flatter and ensure my most sanguine expectations. On leaving the deck I gave directions for the course to be steered during the night. The master had the first watch, the gunner the middle watch, and Mr. Christian the morning watch. This was the turn of duty for the night. Just before sunrising on Tuesday the 28th, while I was yet asleep, Mr. Christian, officer of the watch, Charles Churchill, ship's corporal, John Mills, gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, seaman, came into my cabin, and seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, threatening me with instant death if I spoke or made the least noise. I called, however, as loud as I could in hopes of assistance, but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party by placing sentinels at their doors. There were three men at my cabin door, besides the four within. Christian had only a cutlass in his hand, the others had muskets and bayonets. I was hauled out of bed and forced on deck in my shirt, suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands and note four behind my back held by fletcher christian and charles churchill with a bayonet at my breast and two men alexander smith and thomas burkett behind me with loaded muskets cocked and bayonets fixed i demanded the reason of such violence but received no other answer than abuse for not holding my tongue the master the gunner mr elphinstone the master's mate and nelson were kept confined below, and the fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain and carpenter, and also Mr. Samuel the clerk, were allowed to come upon deck, where they saw me standing abaft the mizzenmast, with my hands tied behind my back, under a guard, with Christian at their head. The boatswain was ordered to hoist the launch out, with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. When the boat was out, Mr. Hayward and Mr. Hallett, two of the midshipmen, and Mr. Samuel were ordered into it. I demanded what their intention was in giving this order, and endeavored to persuade the people near me not to persist in such acts of violence. But it was to no effect. Hold your tongue, sir, or you are dead this instant, was constantly repeated to me. The master by this time had sent to request that he might come on deck, which was permitted, but he was soon ordered back again to his cabin. When I exerted myself in speaking loud, to try if I could rally any with a sense of duty in them, I was saluted with D blank N his eyes, the blank, blow his brains out, while Christian was threatening me with instant death if I did not hold my tongue. I continued my endeavors to turn the tide of affairs, when Christian changed the cutlass which he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands, he threatened with many oaths to kill me immediately if I would not be quiet. The villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed. Particular persons were called on to go into the boat, and were hurried over the side, whence I concluded that with these people I was to be set adrift. I therefore made another effort to bring about a change, but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out. The boatswain and seamen who were to go in the boat were allowed to collect twine, canvas, lines, sails, cordage, an eight-and-twenty-gallon cask of water, 
and Mr. Samuel got one hundred and fifty pounds of bread, with a small quantity of rum and wine, also a quadrant and compass, but he was forbidden, on pain of death, to touch either map, ephemeris, book of astronomical observations, sextant, timekeeper, or any of my surveys or drawings. The mutineers, having forced those of the seamen whom they meant to get rid of into the boat, Christian directed a dram to be served to each of his own crew. I then unhappily saw that nothing could be done to effect the recovery of the ship. There was no one to assist me, and every endeavour on my part was answered with threats of death. The officers were next called upon deck, and forced over the side into the boat, while I was kept apart from every one, abaft the mizzenmast. Christian, armed with a bayonet, holding me by the bandage that secured my hands. The guard round me had their pieces cocked, but on my daring the ungrateful wretches to fire, they uncocked them. Isaac Martin, one of the guard over me, I saw had an inclination to assist me, and as he fed me with shaddock, my lips being quite parched, we explained our wishes to each other by our looks. But this being observed, Martin was removed from me. He then attempted to leave the ship, for which purpose he got into the boat, but with many threats they obliged him to return. The armorer, Joseph Coleman, and two of the carpenters, Mackintosh and Norman, were also kept, contrary to their inclination, and they begged of me, after I was astern in the boat, to remember that they declared they had no hand in the transaction. Michael Byrne, I am told, likewise wanted to leave the ship. It is of no moment for me to recount my endeavours to bring back the offenders to a sense of their duty. All I could do was by speaking to them in general, but it was to no purpose, for I was kept securely bound, and no one except the guard suffered to come near me. To Mr. Samuel, clerk, I am indebted for securing my journals and commission with some material ship papers. Without these I had nothing to certify what I had done, and my honour and character might have been suspected, without my possessing a proper document to have defended them. All this he did with great resolution, though guarded and strictly watched. He attempted to save the timekeeper, and a box of my surveys, drawings, and remarks for fifteen years past, which were numerous. When he was hurried away with, D blank N your eyes, you are well off to get what you have. It appeared to me that Christian was some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates. At length he determined on the latter, and the carpenter was ordered into the boat. He was permitted, but not without some opposition, to take his tool-chest. Much altercation took place among the mutinous crew during the whole business. Some swore, I'll be D-blank-D if he does not find his way home, if he gets anything with him. And when the carpenter's chest was carrying away, D-blank in my eyes, he will have a vessel built in a month. While others laughed at the helpless situation of the boat, being very deep, and so little room for those who were in her. As for Christian, he seemed as if meditating destruction on himself and every one else. I asked for arms, but they laughed at me, and said I was well acquainted with the people among whom I was going, and therefore did not want them. Four cutlasses, however, were thrown into the boat, after we were veered astern. The officers and men being in the boat, they only waited for me, of which the master-at-arms informed Christian, who then said, Come, Captain Bly, your officers and men are now in the boat, and you must go with them. If you attempt to make the least resistance, you will instantly be put to death, and without further ceremony, with a tribe of armed ruffians about me, I was forced over the side, when they untied my hands. Being in the boat, we were veered astern by a rope, a few pieces of pork were thrown to us, and some clothes, also the cutlasses, I have already mentioned, and it was then that the armorer and carpenters called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction. After having undergone a great deal of ridicule, and being kept for some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches, we were at length cast adrift in the open ocean. I had with me in the boat the following persons. Names, Stations. John Fryer, Master. Thomas Ludwig, Acting Surgeon. David Nelson, Botanist. William Peckover, Gunner. William Cole, Bosun. William Purcell, Carpenter. William Elphinstone, Master's Mate. Thomas Hayward, Midshipman. John Hallett, Do. John Norton, Quartermaster. Peter Linkletter, Do. Lawrence Leboge, Sailmaker. John Smith, Cook. Thomas Hall, Do. George Simpson, Quartermaster's Mate. 
Robert Tinkler, a boy, Robert Lamb, butcher, Mr. Samuel, clerk, in all eighteen. There remained in the bounty, names, stations, Fletcher Christian, master's mate, Peter Haywood, midshipman, Edward Young, midshipman, George Stewart, midshipman, Charles Churchill, master-at-arms, John Mills, gunner's mate, James Morrison, boatswain's mate, Thomas Burkett, able seaman, Matthew Quintel, do, John Sumner, do, John Millward, do, William McCoy, do, Henry Hillbrandt, do, Michael Byrne, do, William Muspratt, do, Alexander Smith, do, John Williams, do, Thomas Ellison, do, Isaac Martin, do, Richard Skinner, do, Matthew Thompson, do, William Brown, gardener, Joseph Coleman, armorer, Charles Norman, carpenter's mate, Thomas McIntosh, carpenter's crew, in all twenty-five, and the most able of the ship's company. Christian, the chief of the mutineers, is of a respectable family in the north of England. This was the third voyage he had made with me, and as I found it necessary to keep my ship's company at three watches, I had given him an order to take charge of the third, his abilities being thoroughly equal to the task, and by this means the master and gunner were not at watch and watch. Haywood is also of a respectable family in the north of England, and note five, and a young man of abilities as well as Christian. These two had been objects of my particular regard and attention, and I had taken great pains to instruct them, having entertained hopes that as professional men they would have become a credit to their country. Young was well recommended, and had the look of an able stout seaman, fell short of what his appearance promised. In the account sent home he is thus described, Edward Young, midshipman, aged twenty-two years, dark complexion, and a rather bad look, strong made, has lost several of his foreteeth, and those that remain are all rotten. Stuart was a young man of credible parents in the Orkneys, at which place, on the return of the resolution from the South Seas in 1780, we received so many civilities that, on that account only, I should gladly have taken him with me, but independent of this recommendation, he was a seaman, and had always borne a good character. Notwithstanding the roughness with which I was treated, the remembrance of past kindnesses produced some signs of remorse in Christian. When they were forcing me out of the ship, I asked him if this treatment was a proper return for the many instances he had received of my friendship. He appeared disturbed at my question, and answered with much emotion, That, Captain Bly, that is the thing. I am in hell. I am in hell. As soon as I had time to reflect, I felt an inward satisfaction, which prevented any depression of my spirits. Conscious of my integrity, an anxious solitude for the good of the service in which I had been engaged, I found my mind wonderfully supported, and I began to conceive hopes, notwithstanding so heavy a calamity, that I should one day be able to account to my king and country for the misfortune. A few hours before, my situation had been peculiarly flattering. I had a ship in the most perfect order, and well stored with every necessary both for service and health, by early attention to those particulars I had, as much as lay in my power, provided against any accident, in case I could not get through Endeavour Straits, as well as against what might befall me in them. Add to this, the plants had been successfully preserved in the most flourishing state, so that upon the whole the voyage was two-thirds completed, and the remaining part, to all appearance, in a very promising way, every person on board being in perfect health, to establish which was ever amongst the principal objects of my attention. It will very naturally be asked, what could be the reason for such a revolt? In answer to which I can only conjecture that the mutineers had flattered themselves with the hopes of a more happy life among the Otahitians than they could possibly enjoy in England, and this, joined to some female connections, most probably occasioned the whole transaction. The ship, indeed, while within our sight, steered to the west-north-west, but I considered this only as a feint, for when we were sent away, huzzah for Otaheite was frequently heard among the mutineers. The women of Otaheite are handsome, mild, and cheerful in their manners and conversation, 
possessed of great sensibility, and have sufficient delicacy to make them admired and beloved. The chiefs were so much attached to our people, that they rather encouraged their stay among them than otherwise, and even made them promises of large possessions. Under these and many other attendant circumstances, equally desirable, it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at, though scarcely possible to have been foreseen, that a set of sailors, most of them void of connections, should be led away, especially when, in addition to such powerful inducements, they imagined it in their power to fix themselves, in the midst of plenty, on one of the finest islands in the world, where they need not labor, and where the allurements of dissipation are beyond anything that can be conceived. The utmost, however, that any commander could have supposed to have happened is, that some of the people would have been tempted to desert. But if it should be asserted that a commander is to guard against an act of mutiny and piracy in his own ship, more than by the common rules of service, it is as much to say that he must sleep locked up, and when awake, be girded with pistols. Desertions have happened, more or less, from most of the ships that have been at the Society Islands, but it has always been in the commander's power to make the chiefs return their people. The knowledge, therefore, that it was unsafe to desert, perhaps first led mine to consider with what ease so small a ship might be surprised, and that so favorable an opportunity would never offer to them again. The secrecy of this mutiny is beyond all conception. Thirteen of the party, who were with me, had always lived forward among the seamen, yet neither they, nor the messmates of Christian, Stuart, Haywood, and Young, had ever observed any circumstance that made them in the least suspect what was going on. To such a close planned act of villainy, my mind being entirely free from any suspicion, it is not wonderful that I fell a sacrifice. Perhaps if there had been marines on board, a sentinel at my cabin door might have prevented it, for I slept with the door always open, that the officer of the watch might have access to me on all occasions, the possibility of a conspiracy being ever the farthest from my thoughts. Had their mutiny been occasioned by any grievances, either real or imaginary, I must have discovered symptoms in their discontent, which would have put me on my guard, but the ease was far otherwise. Christian, in particular, I was on the most friendly terms with. That very day he was engaged to have dined with me, and the preceding night he excused himself from supping with me, on pretense of being unwell, for which I felt concerned, having no suspicions of his integrity and honour. Such is the story published by Lieutenant Bly immediately on his return to England, after one of the most distressing and perilous passages over nearly four thousand miles of the wide ocean, with eighteen persons in an open boat. The story obtained implicit credit, and though Lieutenant Bly's character never stood high in the navy for suavity of manners or mildness of temper, he was always considered as an excellent seaman, and his veracity stood unimpeached. But in this age of refined liberality, when the most atrocious criminals find their apologists, it is not surprising it should now be discovered, when all are dead that could either prove or disprove it, that it was the tyranny of the commander alone and not the wickedness of the ringleader of the mutineers of the bounty that caused that event. We all know, it is said, that mutiny can arise but from one of these two sources, excessive folly or excessive tyranny. Therefore, the logic is admirable, as it is admitted that Bly was no idiot, the inference is obvious. And note six. If this be so, it may be asked to which of the two causes must be ascribed the mutiny at the nor, etc., the true answer will be, to neither. Not only, continues the writer, was the narrative which he published proved to be false in many material bearings, by evidence before a court-martial, but every act of his public life after this event, from his successive command of the director, the glayton, and the warrior, to his disgraceful expulsion from New South Wales, was stamped with an insolence and inhumanity and coarseness which fully developed his character. There is no intention, in narrating this eventful history, to accuse or defend either the character or the conduct of the late Admiral Bly. It is well known his temper was irritable in the extreme, but the circumstance of his having been the friend of Captain Cook, with whom he sailed as a master, of his ever afterwards being patronized by Sir Joseph Banks, of the Admiralty promoting him to the rank of commander, 
appointing him immediately to the providence to proceed on the same expedition to otaheite and of his returning in a very short time to england with complete success and recommending all his officers for promotion on account of their exemplary conduct of his holding several subsequent employments in the service of his having commanded ships of the line in the battles of copenhagen and camperdown and risen to the rank of a flag officer these may perhaps be considered to speak something in his favour and be allowed to stand as some proof that with all his failings he had his merits that he was a man of coarse habits and entertained very mistaken notions with regard to discipline is quite true yet he had many redeeming qualities the accusation by the writer in question of bligh having falsified his narrative is a very heavy charge and it is to be feared is not wholly without foundation though it would perhaps be more correct to say that in the printed narrative of his voyage and the narrative on which the mutineers were tried there are many important omissions from his original manuscript journal some of which it will be necessary to notice presently the same writer further says we know that the officers fared in every way worse than the men and that even young Haywood was kept at the masthead no less than eight hours at one spell, in the worst weather which they encountered off Cape Horn. Perhaps Haywood may himself be brought forward as authority, if not to disprove, at least to render highly improbable, his experiencing any such treatment on the part of his captain. This young officer, in his defense, says, Captain Bly, in his narrative, acknowledges that he had left some friends on board the bounty and no part of my conduct could have induced him to believe that I ought not to be reckoned of the number. Indeed, from his attention to, and very kind treatment of me personally, I should have been a monster of depravity to have betrayed him. The idea alone is sufficient to disturb a mind, where humanity and gratitude have, I hope, ever been noticed as its characteristic features. Bly, too, has declared in a letter to Haywood's uncle, Holwell, after accusing him of ingratitude that he never once had an angry word from me during the whole course of the voyage as his conduct always gave me much pleasure and satisfaction in looking over a manuscript journal kept by morrison the boatswain's mate who was tried and convicted as one of the mutineers but received the king's pardon the conduct of bligh appears in a very unfavourable point of view this morrison was a person from talent and education far above the situation he held in the bounty he had previously served in the navy as midshipman and after his pardon was appointed gunner of the blenheim in which he perished with sir thomas trowbridge in comparing this journal with other documents the dates and transactions appear to be correctly stated though the latter may occasionally be somewhat too highly coloured how he contrived to preserve this journal in the wreck of the pandora does not appear but there can be no doubt of its authenticity having been kept among the late captain haywood's papers various passages in it have been corrected either by this officer or some other person but without altering their sense it would appear from this important document that the seeds of discord in the unfortunate ship bounty were sown at a very early period of the voyage it happened as was the case in all small vessels that the duties of commander and purser were united in the person of lieutenant bligh and it would seem that this proved the cause of very serious discontent among the officers and crew of the mischief arising out of this union the following statement of mr morrison may serve as a specimen at teneriffe lieutenant bly ordered the cheese to be hoisted up and exposed to the air which was no sooner done than he pretended to miss a certain quantity and declared that it had been stolen the cooper henry hillbrandt informed him that the cask in question had been opened by the orders of mr samuel his clerk who acted also as steward and the cheese sent on shore to his own house previous to the bounty leaving the river on her way to portsmouth lieutenant bligh without making any further inquiry immediately ordered the allowance of that article to be stopped both from officers and men until the deficiency should be made good and told the cooper he would give him a d blank d good flogging if he said another word on the subject it can hardly be supposed that a man of bligh's shrewdness if disposed to play the rogue would have placed himself so completely in the hands of the cooper in a transaction which if revealed must have cost him his commission 
again on approaching the equator some decayed pumpkins purchased at tenerife were ordered to be issued to the crew at the rate of one pound of pumpkin for two pounds of biscuit the reluctance of the men to accept this proposed substitute on such terms being reported to lieutenant bligh he flew upon the deck in a violent rage turned the hands up and ordered the first man on the list of each mess to be called by name at the same time saying i'll see who will dare to refuse the pumpkin or anything else i may order to be served out to which he added you d blank d infernal scoundrels i'll make you eat grass or anything you can catch before i have done with you this speech had the desired effect every one receiving the pumpkins even the officers next comes a complaint respecting the mode of issuing beef and pork but when a representation was made to lieutenant bligh in the quiet and orderly manner prescribed by the twenty-first article of war he called the crew aft told them that everything relative to the provisions was transacted by his orders that it was therefore needless for them to complain as they would get no redress he being the fittest judge of what was right or wrong and that he would flog the first man who should dare attempt to make any complaint in future to this imperious menace they bowed in silence and not another murmur was heard from them during the remainder of the voyage to otaheite it being their determination to seek legal redress on the bounty's return to england happy would it have been had they kept their resolution by so doing if the story be true they would amply have been avenged a vast number of human lives spared and a world of misery avoided according to this journalist the seeds of eternal discord were sown between lieutenant bligh and some of his officers while in adventure bay van Diemen's land and arriving at matavia bay in otaheite he is accused of taking the officers hogs and breadfruit and serving them to the ship's company and when the master remonstrated with him on the subject he replied that he would convince him that everything became his as soon as it was brought on board that he would take nine-tenths of every man's property and let him see who dared to say anything to the contrary the sailors' pigs were seized without ceremony and it became a favor for a man to obtain an extra pound of his own meat the writer then says the object of our visit to the society islands being at length accomplished we weighed on the fourth april seventeen eighty nine every one seemed in high spirits and began to talk of home as though they had just left jamaica instead of otaheite so far onward did their flattering fancies waft them on the twenty third we anchored off anamooka the inhabitants of which island were very rude and attempted to take the casks and axes from the party sent to fill water and cut wood a musket pointed at them produced no other effect than a return of the compliment by poising their clubs or spears with menacing looks and as it was lieutenant bligh's orders that no person should affront them on any occasion they were emboldened by meeting with no check to their insolence they at length became so troublesome that mr christian who commanded the watering party found it difficult to carry on his duty but on acquainting lieutenant bligh with their behavior he received a volley of abuse was d blank d as a cowardly rascal and asked if he were afraid of naked savages whilst he had weapons in his hand to this he replied in a respectful manner the arms are of no effect sir while your orders prohibit their use this happened but three days before the mutiny and the same circumstance is noticed but somewhat differently in bligh's m s journal where he says the men cleared themselves and they therefore merit no punishment as to the officers i have no resource nor do i ever feel myself safe in the few instances i trust to them a perusal of all the documents certainly leads to the conclusion that all his officers were of a very inferior description they had no proper feeling of their own situation and this together with the contempt in which they were held by bligh and which he could not disguise may account for that perfect indifference with regard both to the captain and the ship which was manifested on the day of the mutiny that sad catastrophe if the writer of the journal be correct was hastened if not brought about by the following circumstance of which bligh takes no notice in the afternoon of the twenty seventh lieutenant bligh came upon deck and missing some of the cocoanuts which had been piled up between the guns said they had been stolen and could not have been taken away without the knowledge of the officers all of whom were sent for and questioned on the subject on their declaring that they had not seen any of the people touch them he exclaimed then you must have taken them yourselves 
and proceeded to inquire of them separately how many they had purchased. On coming to Mr. Christian, that gentleman answered, I do not know, sir, but I hope you do not think me so mean as to be guilty of stealing yours. Mr. Bly replied, Yes, you d-blank-d hound, I do. You must have stolen them from me, or you would be able to give a better account of them. Then turning to the other officers, he said, God d-blank-n you, you scoundrels, you are all thieves alike, and combine with the men to rob me. I suppose you will steal my yams next, but I'll sweat you for it, you rascals. I'll make half of you jump overboard before you get through Endeavour Straits. This threat was followed by an order to the clerk to stop the villain's grog, and give them but half a pound of yams to-morrow. If they steal them, I'll reduce them to a quarter. It is difficult to believe that an officer in His Majesty's service could condescend to make use of such language to the meanest of the crew, much less to gentlemen. It is to be feared, however, that there is sufficient ground for the truth of these statements. With regard to the last, it is borne out by the evidence of Mr. Fryer, the master, on the court-martial. This officer being asked, what did you suppose to be Mr. Christian's meaning, when he said he had been in hell for a fortnight? Answered, from the frequent quarrels they had had, and the abuse which he had received from Mr. Bly. Had there been any very recent quarrel? The day before, Mr. Bly challenged all the young gentlemen and people with stealing his coconuts. It was on the evening of this day that Lieutenant Bly, according to his printed narrative, says Christian was to have supped with him, but excused himself on account of being unwell, and that he was invited to dine with him on the day of the mutiny. End Chapter 3 Part 1part two of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of h m s bounty its cause and consequences this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by barry eads the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of h m s bounty by sir john barrow chapter three part two the mutiny every one of these circumstances and many others which might be stated from mr morrison's journal are omitted in bligh's published narrative but many of them are alluded to in his original journal and others that prove distinctly the constant reproofs to which his officers were subject and the bad terms on which they stood with their commander a few extracts from this journal will sufficiently establish this point in so early a part of the voyage as their arrival in Adventure Bay, he found fault with his officers, and put the carpenter into confinement. Again at Matavia Bay, on the 5th December, Bly says, I ordered the carpenter to cut a large stone that was brought off by one of the natives, requesting me to get it made fit for them to grind their hatchets on. But to my astonishment he refused, in direct terms, to comply, saying, I will not cut the stone, for it will spoil my chisel. And though there may be law to take away my clothes, there is none to take away my tools. This man having been shown his mutinous and insolent behavior, I was under the necessity of confining him to his cabin. On the 5th January three men deserted in the cutter, on which occasion Bly says, Had the mate of the watch been awake, no trouble of this kind would have happened. I have therefore disrated and turned him before the mast. Such neglectful and worthless petty officers, I believe, never were in a ship as are in this. No orders for a few hours together are obeyed by them, and their conduct in general is so bad that no confidence or trust can be reposed in them. In short, they have driven me to everything but corporal punishment, and that must follow if they do not improve. By Morrison's journal it would appear that corporal punishment was not long delayed, for on the very day, he says, the midshipman was put in irons and confined from the 5th January to the 23rd March, eleven weeks. On the 17th January, orders being given to clear out the sail-room and to air the sails, many of them were found very much mildewed and rotten in many places, on which he observes, if I had any officers to supersede the master and boatswain, or was capable of doing without them, considering them as common seamen, they should no longer occupy their respective stations. 
scarcely any neglect of duty can equal the criminality of this. On the 24th January, the three deserters were brought back and flogged, then put in chains for further punishment. As this affair, he says, was solely caused by the neglect of the officers who had the watch, I was induced to give them all a lecture on this occasion, and endeavor to show them that, however exempt they were at present from the like punishment, yet they were equally subject, by the Articles of War, to a condign one. He then tells them that it is only necessity that makes him have recourse to reprimand, because there are no means of trying them by court-martial, and adds a remark, not very intelligible, but what he calls an unpleasant one, about such offenders having no feelings of honor or sense of shame. On the 7th March, a native Otahitian, whom Bly had confined in irons, contrived to break the lock of the Bilboa bolt and make his escape. I had given, says Bly, a written order that the mate of the watch was to be answerable for the prisoners, and to visit and see that they were safe in his watch, but I have such a neglectful set about me that I believe nothing but condign punishment can alter their conduct. Verbal orders, in the course of a month, were so forgotten that they would impudently assert no such thing or directions were given, and I have been at last under the necessity to trouble myself with writing what by decent young officers would be complied with as the common rules of the service. Sir Stuart was the mate of the watch. These extracts show the terms on which Bly was with his officers, and these few instances, with others from Morrison's journal, make it pretty clear that though Christian, as fiery and passionate a youth as his commander could well be, and with feelings too acute to bear the foul and opprobious language constantly addressed to him, was the sole instigator of the mutiny, the captain had no support to expect, and certainly received none from the rest of his officers. That Christian was the sole author appears still more strongly from the following passage in Morrison's journal. When Mr. Bly found he must go into the boat, he begged of Mr. Christian to desist, saying, I'll pawn my honor, I'll give my bond, Mr. Christian, never to think of this, if you'll desist, and urged his wife and family. To which Mr. Christian replied, No, Captain Bly, if you had any honor, things had not come to this, and if you had any regard for your wife and family, you should have thought on them before, and not behave so much like a villain. Lieutenant Bly again attempted to speak, but was ordered to be silent. The boatswain also tried to pacify Mr. Christian, to whom he replied, It is too late. I have been in hell for this fortnight past, and am determined to bear it no longer. And you know, Mr. Cole, that I have been used like a dog all the voyage. It is pretty evident, therefore, that the mutiny was not, as Bly in his narrative states it to have been, the result of a conspiracy. It will be seen by the minutes of the court-martial that the whole affair was planned and executed between the hours of four and eight o'clock on the morning of the 28th April, when Christian had the watch upon deck, that Christian, unable longer to bear the abusive and insulting language, had meditated his own escape from the ship the day before, choosing to trust himself to fate, rather than submit to the constant upbraiding to which he had been subject. But the unfortunate business of the coconuts drove him to the commission of the rash and felonious act, which ended, as such criminal acts usually do, in his own destruction, and that of a great number of others, many of whom were wholly innocent. Lieutenant Bly, like most passionate men, whose unruly tempers get the better of their reason, having vented his rage about the coconuts, became immediately calm, and by inviting Christian to sup with him that same evening, evidently wished to renew their friendly intercourse, and happy would it have been for all parties had he accepted the invitation. On the same night, towards ten o'clock, when the master had the watch, Bly came on deck, as was his custom, before retiring to sleep. It was one of those calm and beautiful nights, so frequent in tropical reasons, whose soothing influence can be appreciated only by those who have felt it, when after a scorching day the air breathes a most refreshing coolness. It was an evening of this sort, when Bly for the last time came upon deck in the capacity of commander. A gentle breeze scarcely rippled the water, and the moon, then in its first quarter, shed its soft light along the surface of the sea. The short and quiet conversation that took place between Bly and the master on this evening, after the irritation of the morning had subsided, only to burst forth again in all the horrors of mutiny and piracy, recalls to one's recollection that beautiful passage of Shakespeare, where on the evening of the murder, 
Duncan, on approaching the castle of Macbeth, observes to Bunqueo, The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses, etc. A passage which Sir Joshua Reynolds considers as a striking instance of what in painting is termed repose. The subject, he says, of this quiet and easy conversation gives that repose so necessary to the mind after the tumultuous bustle of the preceding scenes and beautifully contrasts the scene of terror that immediately succeeds. While on this lovely night Bly and his master were congratulating themselves on the pleasing prospect of fine weather and a full moon to light them through endeavours dangerous straits, the unhappy and deluded Christian was, in all probability, brooding over his wrongs and meditating on the criminal act he was to perpetrate the following morning, for he has himself stated that he had just fallen asleep about half after three in the morning, and was much out of order. The evidence on the court-martial is sufficiently explicit as to the mode in which this act of piracy was committed. By the journal of James Morrison, the following is the account of the transaction, as given by Christian himself, to the two midshipmen, Haywood and Stuart, both of whom had been kept below. The moment they were allowed to come upon deck, after the boat in which were Bly and his companions had been turned adrift. He said that, finding himself much hurt by the treatment he had received from Lieutenant Bly, he had determined to quit the ship the preceding evening, and had informed the boatswain carpenter and two midshipmen, Stuart and Hayward, of his intention to do so, that by them he was supplied with part of a roasted pig, some nails, beads, and other articles of trade, which he put into a bag that was given him by the last-named gentleman that he put this bag into the clue of Robert Tinkler's hammock, where it was discovered by that young gentleman when going to bed at night, but the business was smothered, and passed off without any further notice. He said he had fastened some staves to a stout plank, with which he intended to make his escape, but finding he could not effect it during the first and middle watches, as the ship had no way through the water, and the people were all moving about, he laid down to rest about half-past three in the morning that when Mr. Stewart called him to relieve the deck at four o'clock, he had but just fallen asleep, and was much out of order, upon observing which Mr. Stewart strenuously advised him to abandon his intention, that as soon as he had taken charge of the deck, he saw Mr. Hayward, the mate of his watch, lie down on the arm-chest to take a nap, and finding that Mr. Hallett, the other midshipman, did not make his appearance, he suddenly formed the resolution of seizing the ship. Disclosing his intention to Matthew Quentel and Isaac Martin, both of whom had been flogged by Lieutenant Bly, they called up Charles Churchill, who had also tasted the cat, and Matthew Thompson, both of whom readily joined in the plot. That Alexander Smith, alias John Adams, John Williams, and William McCoy evinced equal willingness, and went with Churchill to the armorer, of whom they obtained the keys of the arm-chest under pretense of wanting a musket to fire at a shark, then alongside, that finding Mr. Hallett asleep on an arm-chest in the main hatchway, they roused and sent him on deck. Charles Norman, unconscious of their proceedings, had in the meantime awaked Mr. Hayward, and directed his attention to the shark, whose movements he was watching at the moment that Mr. Christian and his confederates came up the fore hatchway, after having placed arms in the hands of several men who were not aware of their design. One man, Matthew Thompson, was left in charge of the chest, and he served out arms to Thomas Burkett and Robert Lamb. Mr. Christian said he then proceeded to secure Lieutenant Bly, the master, gunner, and botanist. When Mr. Christian, observes Morrison in his journal, related the above circumstances, I recollected having seen him fasten some staves to a plank lying on the larboard gangway, as also having heard the boatswain say to the carpenter, It will not do to-night. I likewise remembered that Mr. Christian had visited the fore cockpit several times that evening, although he had very seldom, if ever, frequented the warrant officer's cabins before. If this be a correct statement, and the greater part of it is borne out by evidence on the court-martial, it removes every doubt of Christian being the sole instigator of the mutiny, and that no conspiracy nor preconcerted measures had any existence but that it was suddenly conceived by a hot-headed young man in a state of great excitement of mind, amounting to a temporary aberration of intellect, caused by the frequent abusive and insulting language of his commanding officer. 
Waking out of a short half-hour's disturbed sleep, to take the command of the deck, finding the two mates of the watch, Hayward and Hallett, asleep, for which they ought to have been dismissed the service instead of being, as they were, promoted, the opportunity tempting, and the ship completely in his power, with a momentary impulse he darted down the fore hatchway, got possession of the keys of the arm-chest, and made the hazardous experiment of arming such of the men as he thought he could trust, and effected his purpose. There is a passage in Captain Beechey's account of Pitcairn Island, which, if correct, would cast a stain on the memory of the unfortunate Stuart, who, if there was one innocent man in the ship, was that man. Captain Beechey says, speaking of Christian, his plan, strange as it must appear for a young officer to adopt, who was fairly advanced in an honourable profession, was to set himself adrift upon a raft, and make his way to the island Tofoa, then in sight. As quick in the execution as in the design, the raft was soon constructed, various useful articles were got together, and he was on the point of launching it, when a young officer, who afterwards perished in the Pandora, to whom Christian communicated his intention, recommended him, rather than risk his life on so hazardous an expedition, to endeavour to take possession of the ship, which he thought would not be very difficult, as many of the ship's company were not well disposed towards the commander, and would all be very glad to return to Otaheite, and reside among their friends in that island. This daring proposition is even more extraordinary than the premeditated scheme of his companion, and if true, certainly relieves Christian from part of the odium which has hitherto attached to him as the sole instigator of the mutiny. Relieve him? Not a jot. But on the best authority it may boldly be stated that it is not true, the authority of Stuart's friend and messmate, the late Captain Haywood. Captain Beechey, desirous of being correct in his statement, very properly sent his chapter on Pitcairn's Island for any observations Captain Haywood might have to make on what was said therein regarding the mutiny. Observing in his note which accompanied it, that this account, received from Adams, differed materially from a footnote in Marshall's naval biography, to which Captain Haywood returned the following reply. 5th April, 1830. Dear Sir, I have perused the account you received from Adams of the mutiny and the bounty, which does indeed differ very materially from a footnote in Marshall's naval biography by the editor, to whom I verbally detailed the facts which are strictly true. That Christian informed the boatswain and the carpenter, messengers Haywood and Stewart, of his determination to leave the ship upon a raft, on the night preceding the mutiny, is certain. But that any one of them, Stewart in particular, should have recommended rather than risk his life on so hazardous an expedition, that he should try the expedient of taking the ship from the captain, etc., is entirely at variance with the whole character and conduct of the latter, both before and after the mutiny, as well as with the assurance of Christian himself, the very night he quitted Tahiti, that the idea of attempting to take the ship had never entered his distracted mind until the moment he relieved the deck and found his mate and midshipman asleep. End note 7 at that last interview with Christian, he also communicated to me, for the satisfaction of his relations, other circumstances connected with that unfortunate disaster, which after their deaths may or may not be laid before the public, and although they can implicate none but himself, either living or dead, they may extenuate but will contain not a word of his in defence of the crime he committed against the laws of his country. I am, etc., P. Haywood. Captain Beechey stated only what he had heard from old Adams, who was not always correct in the information he gave to the visitors of his island, but this part of his statement gave great pain to Haywood, who adverted to it on his deathbed, wishing, out of regard for Stuart's memory and his surviving friends, that it should be publicly contradicted, and with this view the above reply of Captain Haywood is here inserted. The temptations, therefore, which it was supposed Otaheite held out to the deluded men of the bounty, had no more share in the transaction than the supposed conspiracy. It does not appear, indeed, that the cry of Huzzah for Otaheite was ever uttered. If this island had been the object of either Christian or the crew, they would not have left it three hundred miles behind them before they perpetrated the act of piracy. But after the deed had been committed, it would be natural enough that they should turn their minds to the lovely island and its fascinating inhabitants, which they had but just quitted, and that in the moment of excitement some of them should have so called out, 
but Bly is the only person who has said they did so. If, however, the recollection of the sunny isle and its smiling women had really tempted the men to mutiny, Bly would himself not be free from blame, for having allowed them to indulge for six whole months among this voluptuous and fascinating people, for though he was one of the most active and anxious commanders of his time, the service, as is observed by a naval officer, was carried on in those days in a very different spirit from that which regulates its movements now, otherwise the bounty would never have passed six whole months at one island, stowing away the fruit, during which time the officers and seamen had free access to the shore. Under similar circumstances nowadays, if the fruit happened not to be ready, the ship would have been off, after ten days' relaxation, to survey other islands, or speculate on coral reefs, or make astronomical observations, in short, to do something or other to keep the devil out of the heads of the crew. End note 8. Bly would appear to have been sensible of this on his next expedition in the Providence, for on that occasion he collected more breadfruit plants than on the former, and spent only half the time in doing so. Be that as it may, Bly might naturally enough conclude that the seamen were casting a lingering look behind towards Otaheite. If, says Forster, who accompanied Cook, we fairly consider the different situations of a common sailor on board the Resolution and of a Tahitian on his island, we cannot blame the former if he attempted to rid himself of the numberless discomforts of a voyage round the world, and prefer an easy life, free from cares, in the happiest climate of the world, to the frequent vicissitudes which are entailed upon the mariner. The most favourable prospects of future success in England, which he might form an idea, could never be so flattering to his senses as the lowly hope of living like the meanest Tahitian. And supposing him to escape the misfortunes incident to seamen, still he must earn his subsistence in England at the expense of labour, and in the sweat of his brow, when the oldest curse on mankind is scarcely felt at Tahiti. Two or three breadfruit trees, which grow almost without any culture, and which flourish as long as he himself can expect to live, supply him with abundant food during three-fourths of the year. The cloth trees and edo roots are cultivated with much less trouble than our cabbages and kitchen herbs. The banana, the royal palm, the golden apple, all thrive with such luxuriance, and require so little trouble, that I may venture to call them spontaneous. Most of their days are therefore spent in a round of various enjoyments, where nature has lavished many a pleasing landscape, where the temperature of the air is warm, but continually refreshed by a wholesome breeze from the sea, and where the sky is almost constantly serene. A kind of happy uniformity runs through the whole life of the Tahitians. They rise with the sun, and hasten to rivers and fountains to perform an ablution equally reviving and cleaning. They pass the morning at work, or walk about till the heat of the day increases, when they retreat to their dwellings, or repose under some tufted tree. There they amuse themselves with smoothing their hair, and anointing it with fragrant oils, or they blow the flute, or sing to it, or listen to the songs of the birds. At the hour of noon, or a little later, they go to dinner. After their meals they resume domestic amusements, during which the flame of mutual affection spreads in every heart, and unites the rising generation with new and tender ties. The lively jest, without any ill-nature, the artless tale, the jocund dance, and frugal supper, bring on the evening, and another visit to the river concludes the actions of the day. Thus contented with their simple way of life, and placed in a delightful country, they are free from cares, and happy in their ignorance. Such is the picture drawn of the happy people of Otaheite by a cold philosophical German doctor, and such, with very little change, Bly found them. As far, however, as the mutiny of his people was concerned, we must wholly discard the idea thrown out by him that the seductions of Otaheite had any share in producing it. It could not have escaped a person of Christian sagacity that certain interrogatories would unquestionably be put by the natives of Otaheite on finding the ship return so soon without her commander, without the breadfruit plants, and with only about half her crew questions he knew to which no satisfactory answer could be made, and though, at subsequent periods, he twice visited that island, it was some time afterwards, and not from choice but necessity. His object was to find a place of concealment, where he might pass the remainder of his days, unheard of and unknown, and where it is to be hoped he had time for sincere repentance. 
the only atonement he could make for the commission of a crime which involved so many human beings in misery and brought others to an untimely end but of this hereafter end of chapter three